What's going on everybody and welcome back to the watch dealers here in the home of the watch industry in Australia right on the Gold Coast. We're back, we've been away from YouTube for a little while but we've got the new boutique set up and ready and we've got some exciting, exciting things to share with you over the next few weeks. But first, the biggest news of the watch industry in the last month, the timepiece scumbag, Anthony Farah ripping off five million dollars and then disappearing, coming back, pulling a Farah. We're gonna talk about it. So, let's take a little time and talk a little watches. So, guys, Anthony Farah, the timepiece gentleman, the biggest shock to no one in the industry, ripped off even more people, this time to the tune of $5 million. And that's what we think. I mean, that, that's only what he's admitting to at the moment. It's that's crazy. It's crazy. Monstrous. So, guys, we're here. Obviously, if you're a returning uh, viewer to the channel, thank you. I'm Lewis. I'm one of the owners of the Watch Dealers. Today, for the first time on camera, we have Paul. He's the other owner of the Watch Dealers here in Australia. He also happens to be my father. So, we're going to talk all these things, but first we should do a customary wristwatch check. Paul, what's on the wrist today? So, today I've got a on Speedmaster 2022, it's the limited edition Tokyo version, um, two tone. I had this watch a couple of weeks ago, loving it at the moment. Um, with my old eyes, I can actually see this, so it's, it's 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 a really really cool watch. Nice bit of contrast between the black and the gold. Absolutely. And for my wrist today, I've got the Rolex GMT Master Two Batgirl. Again, something I've recently picked up, something I've always sort of thought about since they came out with the the Jubilee bracelet. But yeah, great little everyday wearer. A nice piece on the wrist today. But the main topic, the timepiece scumbag, the timepiece gentleman, Anthony Farah, ripping off $5 million in consignment watches. We wanted to talk to you today about why consignment can be difficult, can be, can, there can be pitfalls and things to try and avoid with consignment, but also why consignment can also be a great option for you selling your watch and how to avoid things like these scams and people like Anthony Farah who are dealers who are more likely to have a dealer. So, Paul, what's the first thing that you want everyone out there to know? I think first and foremost is there's obviously a, a disparity between the Australian market and the US market. I mean, there's all these videos coming out at the moment um, and some great, great content with some really, really cool people. You know, Federico had, has had a great discussion on this. Um, but they all seem to, to, to go back to the point is you shouldn't consign, you shouldn't consign. So I don't know if, if this is an, a US thing where there's a problem or whether it's, whether it's a, a worldwide thing. Um, but we know the things that you should do, the pitfalls that you shouldn't do, and how to to go about consigning. Yeah. So my first point would be is, first and foremost, find a brick and mortar store. Absolutely. You need to be able to put that watch somewhere where A, it's gonna be seen by others, um, and B, where it's gonna be secure. Yeah. And any brick and mortar store, and we're gonna keep saying this over and over again through this video, insurance, 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 but any decent brick and mortar store should have a vault or a safe, they should have public liability and jewelry block insurance. Yeah. Um, and I suppose for the for the for the seller, the most important thing is is that watch is then out for view. Exactly. And when we say brick and mortar stores, we're not just meaning a guy in an office or a guy in a shared office or you know, you have to go through public access and, and get it. We're talking an actual store, a, a real storefront with retail. Um, there are the exceptions where you have guys like, you know, huge, huge deals like Nico Leonard, who's operating out of a hotel, but it's still a store. It's still, there's a lot of inventory there. There's vaults, the security. The, the storefront aspect of this comes back to the security aspect. We're talking, you know, buzz access, you know, in and out, only if you're allowed in and out, airlocks, things like that, and then a vault, and not just a, an office safe. Uh, we see a lot of this in Australia with dealers who are operating out of office safes or you know, $50, $100 safes and, oh, your watch is fine, give me your $100,000 watch and I'll sell it for you. And then they leave that night with the watch, take it home, come home, come back to the office the next day. That kind of stuff's really dangerous. So you need to be sure where your watch is being held. I, th I think that's a really great, a really important point because nowadays, you know, we, we, we deal with a lot of great dealers in Australia. There's some really, really good guys out there. Uh, and we know the ones that work from offices, the ones that work from shared, shared buildings. Um, 
and, and the process might be to bank vault the watches. Yeah, you know, and so that's fine. That's secure. Bank vaults are fairly secure. That you'd hope. I mean, my, but my point would be, you know, is is how many watches are they taking from from the office or store or wherever they're trading from to the bank vault? How is it getting there? Is it going by by courier? Is it going by armored car? Yeah. Or is it going in a suitcase and they're, they're wandering through the city? Yeah, you know, and we are, we've only got to look at the crime rate at the moment to see what's happening. So I think first and foremost, as we said, find a brick and mortar store and ask the questions, where are my watches stored yeah. and what insurances do you have? Uh, and, and going along with that, we also then say, let's not do things on a handshake. There's a lot of this going around and we see it in America more than in Australia, but it does happen in Australia. Things on a handshake, selling a $100,000 watch on a handshake with no agreement, no contract, no, no paperwork, nothing to fall back on other than some guy's word who you may have known for years or you may have just met. Just because other people say this person's legitimate doesn't mean they really are. You do your research and part of that and part of having that comfort level is paperwork, a contract, a legally binding consignment agreement. That's really important and something that we see far too few of in the watch industry. Uh, we went through a whole process with our legal team here at the Watch Dealers on drafting up our consignment agreement that it is legally defensible and it, on, it holds us and the customers accountable to the actions regarding that watch and that sale. I think that's really important. I think the integrity of this, of this industry um, is paramount to what we do. We're dealing with luxury items, and yes, you know, at the watch dealers, we've got $500 watches, $1,000 watches, and we've got four of a million dollar watches. So, you know, for us, the integrity of keeping the customer safe, keeping the product safe, and keeping our business safe is, is, is all part of that same circle, you know. So, um, I, can only, I can only sort of say what we do, but when we do a consignment, um, we negotiate the price with the client, we give them a fixed fee uh, percentage or a fixed fee, and that paperwork is signed electronically, and all parties get a copy of it. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, you know, for us, that, that, that contract should be tested. So for us, you know, if we need to revoke the contract or they need to revoke the contract, um, it can be done. You know, so it, it's really, really important. And, and as Lewis says, no handshake deals. You yeah. know, this is we, we've seen this now with, with timepiece gentlemen. You know, this is where a lot of his problems have come up is the customers are selling watches with him and it's on a handshake and there's no real paper trail. There's no real evidence of anything. So this guy that we know of has ripped $5 million off people, but there could be a lot more that really could just be out there in the ether on a handshake. Absolutely. And it, it's, it's a scary process. And I think one of, one of Frederico's comments, I'm not sure it was Frederico, said, oh, because it was a consignment and they physically gave that watch to him, there's no recourse now for those clients. That can't be true. I don't think it's true. Yeah, look, I think the next thing that we need to be thinking about is making sure that your watch is accessible to you during that consignment period. Because one of the things that's come up that I find absolutely mind-blowing is this tendency of dealers to hand your watch over to another dealer to sell in a different market. Um, it happens a lot more in the United States than it does in Australia. Our market is a little bit tighter than that. Um, but obviously our country is pretty much just as big. So I couldn't possibly imagine handing a consignee's watch to a dealer in Perth, which is a nine hour flight from us, to another dealer there to say, hey, can you sell that in your market? But apparently, this is happening a lot in America, and this is something that you really need to be careful of. If you have a consignment agreement with a store, well, that's the agreement, right? I'm sure when you walked into that store or to that dealer and said, can you sell my watch for this fee? You didn't expect them to hand that off to Joe Blow dealer down the road and say, hey, I'll give you 200 bucks if you do if you sell this watch for me and I'll keep the two grand. Yeah, That's I, crazy. I think I think it's an important point. And again, I, I'm, like you said, I'm not sure if it's an American-based thing. It has to be, right? We've had this issue where you know, you've got people selling multiple, the same watch multiple times or they're part X in the one consignment watching for another watch. Yep. You know, and then when the money falls out, hopefully eventually it goes back to the client. Well, you know, in my mind, Every single piece that belongs to a client is third piece. So yeah. therefore, the profit that falls out of that watch is on, on sale only, um, and it goes back to the client straight away. And again, we get back to the integrity of this business, the integrity of the dealers you're dealing with, um, and making sure you know everything is just correct. It's yeah. just, just a grown-up way of doing business. <laughs> and, and something that you said there is interesting, that, that watch belongs to you, the consignee. This is something that Farrow was doing, and another scumbaggy thing that I think he did was wearing consignment watches out in public. Oh. Just someone 
gives you a Richard Mille, you know, five hundred thousand dollar watch, and you want to be big dick energy and have a Richard Mille on your wrist that you don't own, and you're walking the streets of Houston or Dallas or New York with half a million dollars that you don't own, that that's insane. Whether that watch is a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, you do not own it. You are consigned to sell that watch. Have your own watch collection. You should be a watch nerd. You're in the game. Have your own watch collection. Don't wear the stock and definitely don't wear cons cons customers' watches. I think one of the funniest, funniest things that we see on a regular basis is we'll see it through the, the dealer forums that we, we own and we, we run um, or we belong to. And you'll see somebody put a wrist shot off and they'll be showing the wrist and say, you know, brand new, never worn. Oh. And they're just sitting on the wrist in the car. Yeah, doing a shoot. Well, that watch is now no longer brand new, never worn. It's crazy. It's on the dealer's wrist. So, you know, l l again, a little bit of transparency. Um, ask these questions. So when you go to your, your dealership, um, ask these questions. It, yeah. It's it's not rocket science. It's, you know, as I say, it's grown-up business. It's understanding and making sure that you're all on the same page when you're looking at this, these products. And it's as simple as that dealer wearing your consignment watch out public puts a mark on it. Now, odds are they're not going to tell you that they've put a mark on that watch. So what they're going to do is they're going to polish that out for you. And now your watch is polished. And perhaps you didn't want that vintage Rolex polished or that Richard Mille polished. Or something. And now you've got a polished watch that you're trying to sell and you didn't know about it. Yeah, it, it. It's so bad. And we do see it in Australia sometimes with very sm a lot of the smaller dealers who are trying to look a lot bigger than they are, who really probably aren't watch collectors or aren't watch nerds. And, and, pretending and finding a dollar, yeah. wearing consignment watches. I think that is unacceptable in this industry. Do not wear your customers' watches unless you have absolute express permission to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Insane. Absolutely. So, hey, Lou, so, so let's now assume, because not everybody's a, a brick and mortar store, not everybody's been fortunate like we have to be able to open a, a full-time store. What makes a legitimate dealer. I mean, we, we see, especially in Australia at the moment, last year it was all, you know, you see on Facebook, brick and mortar store, brick and mortar store, and it's an office, uh, which is all well and good. Um, and now it's dealer license, dealer license, dealer license. Yeah, look, anyone can apply for a dealer license, and anyone can do that. So that, that goes some way, obviously, a legitimate dealer should have a dealer license, that's no problem at all, it goes without saying. But I think it, it comes back to asking the right questions and, and Having a bit of critical thinking on your part, you know, you're selling a watch with someone or selling a watch to someone or buying from someone. Um, are they acting in a legitimate way? And ask lots of questions. When you, if it is an office, and that's absolutely fine, everyone starts somewhere, or some people, that's the way they operate, they've been operating for years. When you go in, where's the vault? Where's the watch's held? What's your insurance? Who do I know that's dealt with you? How long have you been going? What is the inventory? What can I see? If I come into your office and there's three watches on a table, well, and you tell me you've been in business for 20 years, that's, that's difficult, yeah? If I go into your office and there's a filing cabinet and that's where you keep the watches, that, that's red flag number one. But it just comes down to making sure that you're safe. When you're consigning a watch for sale, be safe. There's nothing wrong with consigning watches for sale. Odds are you're going to get a better deal at the end of it because you're going to end up with more money in your pocket from a consignment than a straight sale to a dealer. So just go through your due diligence. Take on board what we've said today. Use that as a starting block, if anything, and then go deeper from there. You don't have to take our word as gospel. We're just out here trying to give you a little bit of guidance because we're seeing a lot of this stuff. And with Anthony Farrow lately, I mean, some guys are losing a lot of money. And it's just not fair to everyone. You work hard for this stuff. You work hard to afford these luxury items. And dealers ripping you off, dealers taking advantage of you is not acceptable, guys. So make sure that you're doing the due diligence. You're doing some research on these people and their practices before you hand over that timepiece. It's very, very important. I think it's a great point. I think we'll finish off with that. You know, we, we talked about the pitfalls of consigning. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a true place for, for consigning watches. Yeah. As we've said, you know, the main thing for the clients is they get more money. Absolutely. You know, we buy watches and we consign watches. And normally if we buy watches, you're going to be a couple of thousand dollars a drift. Light, a drift lighter, you know, but we'll consign your watch for a little as five percent in some cases. Um, so you'll get more money in your pocket. That's right. The sales process is no different. You'll still get, we'll still get the sale as quick as we possibly can. Um, so there's a real place for consignment. Um, just do your due diligence. You know, just be, be be careful out there and make sure your assets are protected.
that's it. Guys, let us know in the comments below. And as, of course, like, follow, subscribe, do all the things. We're not going to hammer you with this like everybody else does, but it does help us. But put in the comments below, if you had any consignment issues, are you one of Anthony's victims? Let us know in the comments. Talk to us. We'll get back to everyone as quickly as we can. Until next time, take care.